All right, guys, we're going to try this again. I'm afraid I'm losing another camera here in the collapse of global industrial civilization. This is take number three. Uh, so we will see if the camera makes it through this rant. So anyway, after a spectacularly gorgeous sunrise, it has turned into a gray gloomy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization and the little dog and I are heading off kayaking with some woman we met on Pile of Fish today here on this now a little bit gloomy Sunday morning, November 28th, 2021. So uh, since it is Sunday morning, for the third time, I'm going to attempt to do what I always do, try to always do on Sunday, and that's bring you my doomsday sermon. And if this camera goes off in the middle this time, I'm either gonna give up or I'm just going to put on whatever it takes uh, and you can finish up in the link that I'm going to provide here. But anyway, unbelievably, this uh, essay on the conversation showing up in yesterday's mainstream media news in the middle of all of this crap. Uh, there's this latest uh, barrage of bullshit uh, on the mainstream media. Unbelievably, uh, we have a pearl in the oyster of the mainstream media. And um, see, from the conversation from a fellow named Travis Reeder. Travis Reeder is a bioethicist. A bioethicist, Travis Reeder, and Travis is going to uh, tell us why the climate crisis calls for fewer children, and I would say uh, the everything crisis calls for fewer children. So Travis N. Reeder is the director of the Master of Bio ethics degree program at the Berman Institute of Bioethics, John Hopkins University. Again, I'm going to put the link on here in case this camera shuts down on me and you can finish up. And the other thing is, I just need to make this disclaimer again, uh, just because I choose someone's essay to read as my doomsday sermon does not mean I necessarily agree with every single word uh, <clears throat> that my guest doomsday preachers have to say. Uh, so I'm going to read this essay and assuming this camera still works I will come back with some comments at the end. You can probably, anyone who knows me, knows which part of this I agree with and disagree with. So take it away, Travis. <clears throat> I gotta put on both of my pairs of old man glasses to read this. <clears throat> In 2016, I found myself in the middle of a lively debate because of my work on climate change and the ethics of having children, NPR correspondent Jennifer Ludden profiled some of my work in procreative ethics with an article entitled, Should We Be Having Kids in the Age of Climate Change? Which summarized my published views that we ought to consider a, adopting a small family ethic <coughs> and even pursuing fertility reduction efforts in response to the threat from climate change. Although environmentalists for decades have worried about overpopulation for many good reasons, I suggest the fast upcoming thresholds in climate change provide uniquely powerful reasons to consider taking real action to slow 
population growth. Clearly, that idea struck a nerve. I was overwhelmed by the response in my personal email inbox as well as op-eds and other media outlets and over 70,000 shares on Facebook. I am grateful that so many people took the time to read and reflect on the piece. Having read and digested that discussion, I want to continue it by responding to some of the most vocal criticisms of my own work, which include research on, quote, population engineering, the intentional manipulation of human population size and structure that I've done with my colleagues Jake Earl and Colin Hickey and I'm assuming that the, he's talking about the intentional manipulation to reduce human population size and uh, he has a link to this whole notion maybe we'll come back to that <clears throat> In short, the varied arguments against my views that I am overreacting, that the economy will tank, you know, if we reduce the birth rate, <coughs> and others <coughs> have not changed my conviction that we need to discuss the ethics of having children in this era of climate change. And, um, then he goes on a long rip on how bad will things get and where he just does a uh, pretty much a recap of uh, climate change doomerism 101 we've heard it all uh, a thousand times uh, you can go on the link I'm going to skip over uh, most of this. Let's move on. You know, what, what he does is he looks at some of the predictions of anywhere from one and a half to uh, four degrees. So we're going to see what happens. At four degrees sea warming, the World Bank predicts. I'm not sure why he uses the World Bank uh, as, uh, but, but anyway. <clears throat> At four degrees sea warming, the World Bank and, uh, and, and more and more climatologists predict that every summer month will be hotter than any current record heat wave, making the Middle East, North Africa, and the Mediterranean deadly during the summer months. Many coastal cities will be completely underwater and all low-lying nations will likely have to be abandoned. Hundreds of millions, if not billions of people, could become climate refugees as their homelands become uninhabitable. Based on these descriptions, I stand by my predictions about, you know, how doomed we are. So then he gets into the whole subject of do environmentalist hate babies otherwise known uh, you know this whole subject of anti-natalism and misanthropy and I'm gonna come back uh, with some comments of my own at the end of this sermon if I still have a camera but this is Travis uh, uh, this is his uh, view on this whole subject no, environmentalists don't hate babies. Other critics have argued that advocating for a lower birth rate equals hating babies or being anti-life. Obviously, I don't hate babies. I'm pretty wild about my own kid and small humans in general. So he is a breeder. So Travis is a breeder of one child. This anti-life charge is more interesting but equally wrong. 
the premise seems to be that those who wish to lower fertility rates must be misanthropic or fail to see the value of humans. But that, again, according to Travis, gets things exactly backwards. A radical concern for climate change is precisely motivated by a concern for human life. In particular, the human lives that will be affected by climate disruptions. A valuable philosophical contribution here is the distinction between making people happy and making happy people. When I feed a hungry, now you have to listen to this very carefully, when I feed a hungry person or prevent a harm from befalling someone, I improve a person's well-being. But when I create a person whom I will then feed and prevent from harm, I make a person who will predictably be well off in the first case. I added happiness to the world by helping an existing person, whereas in the second case, I added happiness by creating a person who will be happy. Do you see the difference? I had to read that about six times to see the difference. I, like many philosoph philosophers, believe that it is morally better to make people happy than to make happy people. Those who exist already have needs and wants, and protecting and providing for them is motivated by respect for human life. It is not a harm to someone not to be created. It is not a harm to someone not to be created. In fact, I would argue that it is more anti-life to prioritize creating new life over caring for or even not harming those who already exist. And now, of course, the computer battery is running out. Good Lord, if the camera battery... I anyway. Okay, then he gets into this whole discussion. Can the economy grow with lower population growth? Another opposing argument. People are not only consumers, they are also producers, and so will make the world better. Yes, humans are producers, and many wonderful things have come from human genius, but each person, whatever else they are, genius or dunce, producer or drag on the economy, is also a consumer, and this is the only claim needed in order to be worried about climate change. The problem here is that we have a finite resource. The ability of the Earth's atmosphere to absorb greenhouse gases without violently disrupting the climate. And each additional person contributes to the total amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. So, although humans will hopefully save us, <clears throat> the solution to this cannot be to have as many babies as possible with the with the with the hope that this raises our probability of solving the problem because each baby is also an emitter whether a genius or not Anyway, guys, that is the most asinine argument I have ever heard. Uh, anyway, I can't believe he even insulted our intelligence by mentioning it. Lastly, there is the view that lowering the fertility rates will kill the economy. Several common commenters pointed to low fertility countries like Japan, Italy, and Germany and argue that problems experienced by such countries are proof that the real 
population crisis is our dropping fertility rate. We need more babies to grow into healthy young producers to keep our economic engine running. The truth in this objection is the following. An economy that requires infinite growth to be healthy will be harmed in a world of finite resources. But if it's true that our economies cannot survive slowing or even reversing population growth, then we are in some trouble no matter what. Why? It is simple logic that we cannot grow our population forever. We can either reflect now on how to protect our economy while working toward a sustainable population, or we can ignore the problem. Until nature forces it on us, perhaps violently and unexpectedly. I will conclude with one final thought. I don't enjoy arguing for a small family ethic or a population engineering scheme. Despite snide accusations to the contrary, I get no research funds or any other incentive for making this case. I am arguing these points because I am genuinely worried about the future of our planet and the people who will inherit it, and I believe difficult yet civil discussion is the crucial first step to making that future one we won't be condemned for creating. And, uh, amen, brother, uh, Travis N. Reader, but, uh, since both of my batteries are still alive, amazingly, I just wanted to touch on, uh, his arguments about whether environmentalists hate babies and about ant being antinatalist and misanthropic. Uh, you know, the, the premise seems to be that those who wish to f lower fertility rates must be misanthropic or fail to see the value of humans. And I just need to make a few comments on this. So. I don't know by the word or, does he mean failing to see the value of humans? Is that his definition of misanthropic or is it just a cousin of it? Uh, so, do I hate babies? I do not hate babies. What I don't care for is adults who choose to have babies. That is my problem. To have a baby uh, in the year 2021 or now 2022 is, is not only uh, committing child abuse <coughs> to your baby, <coughs> it is committing planet abuse. Okay? I am not as much anti-baby as I am anti-breeder. So if that makes me an anti-natalist, misanthrope, and guilty as charged, but this other thing about failing to see the value of humans, obviously Travis Reeder, he chose to have a child, so he must see the value of humans. Well, some humans have value, I guess, to other humans. Okay, uh, but beyond the value that some humans have to other humans, I radically disagree with Travis Reader on this. Uh, other than that one little asterisk, there is no value to humans. Humans are the single biggest threat to this planet. They're the single biggest threat to every uh, earthling on the planet. And as much as I love 
uh, my friends and, and all the rest of these people in my own life, that does not sway me from the fact there is no value in humans. Uh, it, it is quite the opposite. In fact, uh, we need a uh, population engineering to get the population of humans to zero. Uh, anyway, just making sure you do not uh, confuse uh, Travis Reader's <coughs> opinion of the value of humans with Sam Mitchell's uh, opinion of the value of humans. I, I, I think we're the most worthless, uh, we're beyond worthless. We're, we're anti-value. We are every value that I value uh, is being directly threatened by humans. And I think I've made my point. But anyway, now that I've finished my Sunday sermon, I'm going to uh, pack up. Getting to be a little bit nicer day, and the little dog and I are going to go head off kayaking with a new human that I... Uh, that I met recently, so I highly suggest you get out there and look for the value of humans wherever you can find it while you still can. Bye, guys. Oh, I guess the both the batteries survived. Ah, getting to be a fine-looking day. Here at Crazy Crane Camp. I hear the Crazy Cranes coming in. Bye, guys.